friends, very good to have you with us again. James, nice to see you. Very good to see you, Ian, yeah, in this mid-Lent season. Uh, indeed. Uh, you seem to be on good form at the moment. Uh, apparently so. <laughs> we'll have lots of laughter during the video that'll be oh, well possibly yeah <laughs> now before we go any further talking of laughter and enjoyment we love it when people do four things to with the video we do we, we, we laugh and enjoy it when when people click like yes, on our videos yeah, um, or subscribe to the channel yes um, indeed don't miss out on future videos yeah um and do share on the social media do share on social media you can just click the link there and it gives you a, 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 a button there to, to share and it you can paste it in there yep Exactly. And do comment as well, either on the social media, on YouTube, wherever. Yeah. yeah. We love having debates about these issues, don't we? We do. It's great, actually. And so some fantastically good questions come up and viewpoints mm. that put. Yeah. 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 And we've had some very encouraging comments in the last couple of weeks. So thank we you have. very much for those. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. But we, we appreciate it. So mm. um, now, James, where are we in the lectionary? We are on the third Sunday of Lent and... Which is John chapter two, verses thirteen to twenty-two. So we're in one of those lectionary Sundays where, in year B, we depart from the gospel for the year, which is Mark. Yes, and we get a passage from John instead, and this yep. is one of those occasions. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and this is really just because Mark is a short gospel, so we don't have enough material to fill out the whole year. Yes, so we stray into the fourth gospel as well, which is neat. Yes. Now, I found it particularly interesting here because we have, in the last couple of weeks, when we've been looking at Mark, we've been noting the distinctness of its style. We're constantly mm. impressed, particularly in these narrative portions, about how how dense it is, and therefore we sort of pause and look at each word and. And, and how it functions with parataxis, so that yes. it is, and this, and this, and this, and this. And, and this is really, really striking in this passage, I think, perhaps more than many others, about two things I think have struck me in this, is that first of all, how carefully crafted the passage is. We'll mm. probably get on to looking at this, but I think the whole passage has a chiastic structure, chiasm, yes. a chiasm based on the Greek letter X, meaning that it has this kind of nested structure. So it starts with something, it goes to somewhere else, and then it comes, sort of comes back to what it started with. Yes. So that's one thing to notice. And the other fascinating thing, which is that the double meanings that we get in the fourth gospel. So we get mm. a literal something, and then actually you've made this observation, often through a commentary of Jesus himself, he sort of then introduces a metaphorical or a spiritual meaning for something that's that's happened literally. Yes, it seems to be quite 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 a, a a pattern that emerges in the fourth gospel that there's, there's an action and then there's a explanatory mm. discourse uh, yeah. engagement uh, yeah. by jesus so it's yeah very much a, a typical kind of, kind of johannine thing yeah yeah now it just occurred to me when you said that that there is a parallel with the synoptics so particularly in mark's gospel for instance you get the parable of the sower which jesus teaches to the crowd, yes. and then they go into the house with the disciples and then jesus explains it mm. So you get the same kind of thing happening. Of course, you don't get parables in the fourth gospel. Instead, no. you actually get, as it were, symbolic actions that Jesus does. And then, again, we get this explanation. So you still have this structure of either teaching or action plus explanation. And both of those really build on the idea of Jesus as the teacher of Israel. They do. Although, interestingly, in this particular passage, of course, his explanation is to a wider circle than the disciples. It's to the Jews who question yeah. him, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So that's that's fascinating. Um, yeah. But yeah, absolutely. You do get it. It's just slightly different forms. Yeah. Yeah. So let's look at the passage itself. So we're mm. in uh, John 2 verse. Now, our reading is from verse 13, I think, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. But in so, fact, it is worth just having a quick look at verse 12. Yeah, because yeah, otherwise we miss out on that because we don't get it when we see look at John 2, 1 to 11. No, we don't. So it's a, yeah. It's a it's a slippery verse that's missed out. <laughs> Naughty yeah. slippery lectionary. So Yeah, yeah. No, I think there's a couple of really fascinating just little details here in this verse. In verse yes, 12. there are. Um, yeah. yeah. No, one is the language of going up and going down. And, and yes. the other is the mention of Capernaum with his mother and brother and, and disciples. Yeah, yeah. And isn't that interesting that he mentions both Jesus' natural family, as it were, mm. but also the new family mm. that is being created through the disciples who are gathering around him. Yeah, that is. And the, the, the juxtaposition of those two is, is mm. well, it feels transitional, doesn't it, really, mm. in terms of mm. the way in which the gospel is, mm. is then worked out and and. The people of God are the family of God, yeah, and especially and, the family and, of Jesus. Yeah, and despite a devotional tradition, actually the Gospels are pretty negative about Jesus's mother. 
They, 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 they are. They are quite pretty. So in pretty. that previous episode, in the in the wedding at Cana, Jesus has really rebuked Mary. Yeah. 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 And of course, we we find in Matthew twelve that sharp contrast where Mary and Jesus, his brothers and sisters, yeah, come to find him because they think he's gone That's mad. Right. Yeah. And then, of course, he says, well, who are my mother, my brothers, my sisters, including women as well, those who, who are here looking around at those listening at his feet, who, who listen to and do the will of God? That's really, yeah. He redefines, he redefines family. Yeah. yeah. You almost wonder whether the writer of the fourth gospel kind of has that episode in mind. Yeah. In, in, yeah. in mentioning this. Yeah. I think the other thing that strikes me here is the mention of Capernaum, because, of course, it's only in the beginning of the synoptics that we know that Capernaum is his ministry base. Yes. So there's another little little pointer there that the writer of the fourth gospel is assuming that we've read the yeah, yeah. synoptics. Absolutely. And then these these geographical references. Now, what's fascinating, again, is we think of the fourth gospel as the most spiritual gospel, but actually it's got the most detailed topographical references. So that was a very interesting thought, yes. Yeah. Yeah, because Cana in Gal Cana is in the hills. Yeah. Where the, the water into wine miracle has happened. And then Capernaum is by the Sea of Galilee. So you have to go down. And it does say he went down to Capernaum. And then, of course, Jerusalem is up in the hills. So, again, naturally, you would say you go, go up. up. Mm. And it's just worth worth recognizing that in Greek and in Hebrew, uh, the verb go up and the verb go down are a single verb. It's not go and up and go and down like we have in English. Mm. Mm. So it, it's just striking that, that the fourth gospel shows a natural familiarity with the geography and the topography. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, we kept yeah. going towards the passage, hadn't we? <laughs> so. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so, so, so we dive into the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. And mm. I mean, I, I think we mention this quite often that Jesus, in the fourth gospel, goes to Jerusalem for a festival. Yes. Uh, and and in fact, really, that's that's the reason we know. Well, it's the reason we suppose Jesus' ministry to have lasted over a period of about three years, because yeah. Yeah. That, that's how many that would fit into that pattern. So yeah. it's yeah. fascinating the way that for some reason we're attached to the idea that the synoptics are more historically accurate, and yet it, it is weird, isn't it? It's not. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. weird. Um, so we've got the Passover mentioned here. You've got a Passover mentioned in chapter twelve, and then of course you've got the Passover of the Passion Week. Yes, yes. Um, and then we've got an unnamed festival in chapter five, and we've got the festival of booths from chapter seven to ten. That's right. Yeah. Anuka at chapter John, in John 10. Yeah. Um, now, there's something interesting here, isn't there, about the Jewishness of this gospel. So on the one hand, we've got this mention of the Passover of the Jews, mm. which seems to me to be best understood as explanatory to someone who's non-Jewish who's reading this. Yes. Uh, and yet this gospel is thoroughly embedded in Jewish patterns of life and the Jewish festivals. Yes, and you, you, uh, it, it is extraordinary, isn't it? And I suppose it, and in a sense, it universalizes it, doesn't it? It, it becomes a gospel yeah. which is to be read by all. Um, yeah. As yeah. We, we tend to think of Matthew as particularly Jewish, don't we? We tend to think of Luke as... Um, or Gentile-leaning. Or Gentile-leaning, yeah. So mm. it's quite interesting that the fourth gospel kind of combines both mm. of those in some ways mm. yeah it does yeah. although interestingly although luke is gentile leaning it's got a huge focus on jerusalem because yeah. <laughs> the early events yeah. start around there yes yes and the irony is that matthew is jewish but doesn't mention the festivals at all so, no no it is odd it is odd. i i omitted people will comment i omitted of course the mention of the passover at the feeding of the five thousand in john six as well of course yeah 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 um and i, I think we probably also need to just pause for a minute and talk about the phrase the jews you die on we should we should yes. because that's quite complicated in the fourth gospel isn't it the way that the length that term it is it is that phrase the jews is used in multiple ways i mean sometimes it means the whole tradition of israel the whole yeah. sort of package sometimes it means those living in judea so it's more of a, of a geographical description as it as, as opposed to those living in galilee yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes it means the leaders of the jews um Mm. Uh, so it, it's it's got multiple multiple references, and one really has to kind of decide. And generally, I think it is quite easy to decide within the context which particular reference is being called upon. Yeah, um, yeah. and then it could it could seem quite confusing, though. Of course, actually, we only need to pause for a minute to realise that 
in English, we often do that. We'll often use a yeah. word with quite yeah. different senses, you know, even sometimes yeah. quite close to each other. But but if the reader, if we're aware that the reader is alert to those things, then it, it's not a problem. No. Um, no. There is um, Mark Stibby in his um, his readings commentary from some years ago. He was quite strong on this and identifying the different groups. And the other thing that he picks out is some of Jesus' most vitriolic language ab about the Jews or in conflict with the Jews in chapter eight is about uh, a group of Jews who had believed in Jesus, but have yes. now fallen away. Yes, that's one of the sort of subgroups, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, uh, and 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 there's particular issues in in, in that dialogue. Yeah, yeah. But we need to bear those those distinctions in mind when people say, oh, you know, the fourth gospel is anti-Semitic and things like that. I think it's quite an important yeah. um, piece of exegesis, isn't it? It is. And and again, in, in in the context of that, one of the one of the really strong emphasis is, and this is what Jesus says to the woman at the well in chapter four, is unequivocally salvation is from the Jews. Jews yeah, absolutely. So in that sense, the, the gospel is the most Jewish of <laughs> yes, it's the most it's the most positive actually yeah 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 but again it's another fascinating way in which the different gospels have similar theological concerns on the one hand but express them in very very different ways yeah so for instance in matthew you get this language when jesus heals the centurion servant in chapter eight where he says you know many will come from the east and west and sit at, sit at abraham's the feast of abraham at abraham's table yeah um so you get that tension between the jewishness on the one hand but the invitation to gentiles on the other and then here it's almost as if the very language of the fourth gospel is saying that the, the gospel the good news is about salvation which comes from the jews but is for everybody for, yes for, for a wider group. and i think there's an i think we'll pick this up in a verse or two but i, I think there's some, some important something important that this story might have to say about that as well actually so yeah okay so we'll make sure you can, make sure we come back to that uh, yeah okay we better get on to the third that's the, se the second verse of our passage. yes yes <laughs> uh and really fascinating one of the things that's disguised in english translations is the different language for temple so we actually have two words yes temple here mm. don't we in verse 14 we've got we've got the word here on which means the wider temple courts and the whole area doesn't it indeed yeah. whereas when when jesus refers back to the temple in verse 19 he, he talks about the nios which is the, the the central sanctuary the holy of holies yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um now there's a there's a some really interesting questions about this this cleansing of the temple um, I don't know whether we want to tackle it now, whether we just sort of put the question out there. And of course, the thing that's most obvious is asking, were there, did Jesus cleanse the temple twice, once early in his ministry and once at the end of his ministry, which led to his crucifixion, to the final conflict? Or are we seeing the fourth right of the fourth gospel creatively relocating that later cleansing earlier? Or are we seeing the synoptic writers taking an early instant and locating it? in the final Passion Week, because after all, they only record Jesus going to Jerusalem once. That's the only place they could put it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've got a strong view on that, or should we just put that question there and let it hang? And then- look Well, we, yes. I mean, I don't have strong views on it, but I think I think the synoptic writers, it's very clear in the synoptics that the crucifixion of Jesus is, is I suppose, brought about, immediate, its immediate um, cause is his attitude to the temple. That's what sets off a train a train of activity against him. Yeah. Um, here, I think it's this story serves in a in a, in a different different way. Mm. So I'm quite open to the idea that there were two. I don't, I, I don't know what what you think, but it, it seems to me that they they these stories function in different ways between the synoptics and and the fourth gospel. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think one of the things that I'm very struck by, and it's really interesting comparing the account. I mean, the account in Luke's gospel is just one sentence. Yeah. It, again, what's fascinating here in this gospel is that the detail that we have. So mm. he made a whip out of cords, which isn't mentioned in the others. And, and no. that also suggests this is something quite premeditated as a sort of prophet, prophetic action. Yeah. Um, and it mentions very specifically that he drove all from the temple courts, he both the sheep and the cattle. And then these very specific details, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. So it's an extremely vivid depiction, which we don't right. get in synoptics. Um, no. So, so that would again suggest to me that potentially it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different event. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and of course, it always, it always offers an alternative uh, answer to that question: What would Jesus do? And the answer is getting angry and overturning the tables and driving people with a whip is, is yeah, is one option. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, which people seem to conveniently forget quite often, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's some interesting background on this. Is it worth? Yes. Yes. I know you've that? been digging around in that, haven't you? Um, because William Lane, in his commentary on Mark, actually, in Mark's um, 
of this of this practice yeah. says that there's actually no evidence of the selling of uh sacrificial animals before AD 30 in the court of the Gentiles mm. and prior to that time uh the Mount of Olives had four markets where you could buy your sacrificial animal on the way to right. the temple of Jerusalem for it to be sacrificed yeah. Yeah, so this yeah. is filling up the court of the Gentiles and I think the what Jesus is doing here in a sense is he is he cleans that out yeah. there's a there's a really interesting sense in which I wonder if the whole the whole course the whole vision of of the Old Testament is that the, the, the all the nations come to the come to the temple so to fill up the court of the Gentiles with the selling of the sacrificial animals doesn't leave any room for the Gentiles to come in so there's, there's a kind of symbolism there yeah. um, which is immediately saying this is there's a there's a universal appeal of the gospel mm. um for it is for all people salvation is from the Jews for yeah. for everyone yeah. um, but I thought that was interesting and, it, and I wonder if Jesus action here would have been seen within the immediate context of Caiaphas, who's the high priest at the time, yes. um, initiating this uh, sort of rival uh, emporium to to the one on the Mount of Olives. Emporium, so, which is actually the Greek word for marketplace, indeed. which is marketplace. what we actually find in the text here. So I'm glad, you, glad you slipped that in. I did, I did just, yeah. Very subtle. Very yeah. But, there's also yeah. there's also the, a curious dynamic here about the literal literal versus intentional fulfillment of scripture so the yeah. reason why the there's the money changes there is 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 in fulfill is in literal fulfillment of the command in exodus 30 13 which says you must pay a half a shekel and, and actually often uh, jewish men paid in pairs because they didn't have a half a shekel they had a shekel yeah and at the time that and and i've put it on the blog related blog article which will which will c come tomorrow if depending on what day you're reading this the next to be the next blog article uh, after the link to this one um the picture of the tyrian shekel which was the one which had pure silver so the one they favored so here's the here's the ultimate irony in trying to fulfill a command literally they actually overturn the intention of it because the tyrian shekel both had an image of a person on it which was you know you should not have a graven image and but also lauded tyre which was yeah. the arch enemy of Israel historically. And in uh, Ezekiel, yes. we get this tirade against, you know, predicting the fall of Tyre, which forms yeah. the basis of um, of Revelation 18 and, and the, the the judgment of, of Babylon, of Rome, yes. again, the enemy of the people. So so you've got this ultimate irony that that uh, that there's a, a kind of a literal fulfillment of a command, which is completely missing the theological point of it. Yeah. And, and, and as you say, now is corrupting the whole purpose of the temple. Yeah, yeah. So there seems to be a kind of consistency in in that what in Jesus' action here and trying to uh, overturn these things in order that the, the proper theological perspective is is seen. Yeah, yeah. It's a little there's a little window here as well, which is worth bearing in mind as historical background, which is the the deep divisions within first century Judaism. That's why I think in scholarship we never talk about Judaism. We talk about Judaisms. And there was mm. huge conflict between different groups here. So mm. one, of the, one of the dynamics involved here as well is the fact that because of the need to pay the temple tax uh, in, in the shekel, it meant that actually the temple had accumulated vast uh, wealth. Yeah. And that people often, poor people who are struggling on the land, often were in debt to the temple. And so in the Jewish, in the Jewish war... Uh, one of the one of the groups one of the first things they did is they went into the temple and they burnt all the debt records so right uh, yeah 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 but far be it from any um church for example today to have accumulated large sums at the center while those on the margins are in debt of course it, 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 well indeed you, can't, you we, can't imagine that happening in the church of england can you no no couldn't possibly no <laughs> sorry that was a bit naughty <laughs> it was a bit naughty and yes <laughs> um right sorry where have we got where have we got to the passage We've got to the doves. So I think we he, we must he, get distracted he, by General Synod. So yeah, no, no, no. He he told those who were selling selling doves, the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house into uh, an emporium. Place. So here Jesus is, is, you know, this is very specifically telling us what yeah. the problem is. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's. And you get this fascinating little little comment again. This is really typical of the fourth yes. isn't it? A kind of little aside, which actually locates the the the, the account of the event. In the context of a later writing it up and remembering it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it 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 does argue. I think it it argues for us that we should read John's Gospel over and over and over again, yeah. because as we do that, we when we read it again, we remember things that connect to what Jesus is doing, just like the early disciples yes. did, and and that's our experience of the Christian life, isn't it? 
that, that the more we read scripture, the more we make the connections between scripture and the more we understand yeah. what is actually going on. That I mean, we're, we're constantly referring in these videos to the Old Testament or uh, aren't we or to another another instance in the New Testament seems connected. And, and that's a really important way of reading scripture. Vital. Yeah. And it also makes it clear this the phrase we're looking at is, is verse 17. His yes. Disciple, his disciples remembered that it is written zeal for your house will consume me, which is a quotation. There is a there is a there is a phrase similar to it in Psalm 119. But actually, I think the verse is referring to is in Psalm 69. 69 yeah. 69, verse, yeah. Verse 9, 69. 9. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is it is, as you say, it's it's looking back to make sense. It was I think it was Soren Kierkegaard, wasn't it, who said life must be lived forwards, but can only be understood backwards. Backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Of all the Danish existential Christian philosophers you might think of, he's the one that comes to mind, really, isn't he? <laughs> so, but but it is. But it is. Yes. But it, it's it's true for the disciples as they look back on the ministry of Jesus and yeah. put it together. Uh, but, yeah. and, but it's also true for us in our own spiritual experience, where you know mm. we think mm. things are happening a certain way at the time, but then we look back and go, "Oh, that's what God was doing," or "That's why." Yeah. He that all. Yeah. This is how it worked out in the end. So yeah. And we should remember that in the present. That's the thing to do. We need to remember that we might look back on this in the future in a different way from the way we're experiencing it now because that can be an encouragement to us yeah, yeah. Uh, um, especially in a difficult time yeah yeah now here we get this sort of linchpin moment and this is where i think you know my observation yeah. is that you get the mention of the passover at the beginning of this passage you get the mention of the passover at the end verse 23 you get the disciples remembering in verse 17 and then you also get the mention of remembering the disciples remembering in verse 22 so you've yep. got the Passover sandwich, you've got the remembering sandwich, then right at the center, then you have this, this temple saying in response to the Jews. Yes. And in these chiastic structures of this particular kind, what's in the center is generally the thing of crucial importance. Yeah. And so this discourse on the temple, this this engagement and this conversation with the Jews in in the, in, in the middle is, mm. is really interesting because it has ramifications through the gospel, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, really one, one of the things that, you know, and especially this use of the phrase "my father's house," yes. you know, crops up again in John fourteen. It's often misunderstood. I mean, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places or mansions, as it used to say in the King James version. Well, still does say in the King James version, but it's really unhelpful. Really, unhelpful. Um, but there are many many dwelling places. This is not this is not the sort of there, there's a there's a nice country house in the sky with lots of rooms, um, which is yeah, where you go when, when you die. die. Yeah. It's yeah. it's an invitation. To yeah. be with Jesus, who is the one who replaces the temple, yeah. and that's very clear from this passage. Yeah. And the reason we can interpret John fourteen in that way is because of John two, and I think that's a really important thing to to recognise. Yeah. And just in John fourteen, the dwelling place is a mone. Yes, and and right at the very beginning of the gospel, the, the first disciples say to him, Jesus, where are you staying? Where are staying. you abiding? abiding. Moneo is just it's the cognate verb. And of course, in John 15, Jesus says, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide, moneo, in me. So he's using yes. exactly the same language. Um, yeah. And I think it's really fascinating to see is, uh, you, this is you have to, as you say, you have to read John, the fourth gospel forwards and then backwards and then forwards and then backwards again. Because actually, right at the very beginning, John 1, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. So there's an yes. allusion there to God's tabernacling presence in the desert. Yes. And then also you've got um, in, in chapter one, in the as we talked about the encounter with Nathaniel, where Jesus is the point, the connection of heaven and earth, the angels going up and down upon him. So and of course, the whole point about the temple was the temple was the point where heaven and earth met. Because yes. the, the temple here, the Nios, the sanctuary is where the Shekinah glory of God dwells yes, absolutely. amongst his people. And of course, now we know that in the incarnation, that is what Jesus, Jesus is the temple presence of God. And then by his spirit, he is now the temple presence. We we become the temple presence of God in, in the world. Absolutely. It's interesting, isn't it? I think this is the first place in John's gospel where um, the, the, there's Jesus references his father. Yes. Which is interesting because along with that words like abide and so on that you've just been mentioning, yeah. these all pick up things that are in the prologue. So, you know, this obviously the father's house, this picking up John 1, 14, 18, yeah. so on. Yes. Yes. And, and and all the rest of it so it, it's all it, we're, we're, we're right into this section in the gospel where the themes of the prologue are being expanded and unfolded yes. all the way through from now on yeah. yeah we did notice that when we talked about the prologue we noticed that you know every little terminal any idea yeah. a little packet it's, that's going to explode with meaning it is yes and here they are beginning to sort of pop uh, all over the, the gospel place. Goes yeah. On. Yeah. yeah yeah um and uh now um 
this is a bit I know we've talked about before and that you love, which is this whole thing about the 46 years. Yeah, that's not, always nice when a mathematician and engineer get together and talk numbers. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. worth it's worth noting that the phrase, um, uh, so where are we? Sorry, taking four, verse 20. 20. They, re they replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. It, we just do need to note just at the beginning that the phrase itself is slightly ambiguous in that what it literally says is uh, uh, 40 and six years has this temple been built. So yeah. It, okay. it could mean yeah. it was completed 46 years ago, it's been built now. But actually, we know that the process was a long time. And yeah. the, the, the better reading of it is to say, that it, it was started 46 years ago. Now, the reason why I think that's interesting, just doing a bit of mathematics, is that um, we, we know that this was um, initiated by Herod the Great, and we know that when he started reigning, which was, ah, uh, it was, sorry, it was in the 18th year of his reign, yeah. uh, of Herod the Great, and um, that this, this part was completed a year and a half later, and that this period of 46 years then takes us um, to the, from, this takes us from 18... Or 17 BC, and it takes us to the Passover in the spring of AD 30. So yeah. it's interesting that we do have a very specific historical reference, and that ties in with the idea that in the fourth gospel, that Jesus's ministry lasted these three years, and it also takes us to his death on April the 3rd, AD 33. Which yeah, is one of the more popular dates for fixing Jesus's death, just because of the way that the 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 yeah. Sabbaths and the Passovers fall together. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you like that, didn't you? I do like that. I think it's a fascinating piece of research, actually. And it, these these numbers in the fourth gospel, John is often very it's very it's very specific in, in John's yeah. gospel, isn't it? And we have this forty six, we have the thirty eight, we have the hundred and fifty three. Yeah, there's some fascinating numbers around here, and I, I can't I can't believe that they don't they're not there for more than just narrative historical purpose but they do illuminate they do illuminate mm. and there are times when you want to take this number symbolically but here it just seems like it's it just seems like a, a useful number that yeah. tells you yeah and once again it points to the historical reality that that, that is that is here yeah. I, I think it's interesting in this exchange though ian i don't know what you, what you think about this but the the jews don't seem to be at all bothered by jesus destroying the temple they seem to be bothered by the idea that he can raise it up in three days so it's a it's it, it's a fascinating Sort of, I think I would have been jolly cross if you know this I was my been this was my pride and joy. This building is so deeply, profoundly meaningful to me within my religious culture. Yes. But, uh, and you're going to say you're going to destroy it, and actually, or, or it's going to be destroyed. But actually, the most important thing that they get cross about is the fact that he he appears to them to be telling them that he can do the impossible. That seems more of a problem. That that is intriguing, isn't it? I. I wonder whether this is connected. I'm just thinking off the top of my head now. I wonder whether this is connected with the theological significance, which is that effectively what Jesus is claiming is that, you know, they, they've established this place, which is the presence of God amongst his people. Mm. It's taken a huge amount of effort and a large amount of work, and it's become yeah. one of the seven wonders of the world. Yes. Jesus is saying that he can establish the temple presence of God as it were, almost at the click of, a fing of his fingers. Yeah, within three days of dying yeah. and rising again, yeah. That's an amazing, that's a really helpful reflection, I think. So, yeah. So it is about, it, 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 isn't, it isn't so much about the bricks and mortar, but it is about no. how, how on earth can you, Jesus, actually claim to establish the presence of God amongst his yeah. people? Yeah. That's but that's interesting. It's not a question I thought about, actually. Mm. Mm. So, yeah. And then we get, um, you know, explicitly... And again, very typical yeah. of the fourth gospel, the narrator is adding his own comment here, verse 21. Yeah. The temple he'd spoken of was his own body. So he's his little parenthetical aside explaining what's going on. And then again, a, a, a reference to the fact that after he was raised from the dead, the disciples recalled what he'd said. Saying, again, yeah. part of this making sense yeah. of it, uh, looking back. I think that verse 21 tucked away there is uh, is of crucial importance, isn't it, for, for the whole of the fourth gospel, for the whole of the gospel, hmm. actually. Um, and if we misunderstand that, we, yeah. we 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 lose so so much. It's just a a brief aside comment, as you say, by the narrator, but yes, it is. explicit. Yeah. Well it, well, it does focus on the idea that resurrection wasn't a merely spiritual thing, but this was actually yeah. his body, and yeah. it also is part of that whole huge 
uh, theological anthropology, I would say, the description of scripture yeah. of what it means to be human, that we are bodily. Jesus was bodily. God yeah. came to us in him because he inhabited a human body. He mm. was bodily raised. And and this is our hope. Our hope is for bodily yes. resurrection in, yeah. in a renewed heaven and earth, as we find yeah. in Revelation 21. Yeah. So... I'm just going to finish by a quick summary on the on the blog article. I've had a little interaction with um, Alistair Roberts, who thinks that there was only one um, cleansing. Mm. Um, he he does. He's very good at reading the theological impact of this passage. And I just make this comment at the end. I think Alistair's points about the narrative effect are well made. The threat of death in Jerusalem at the hands of Jesus's Jewish opponents hangs over the fourth gospel from the beginning mostly in contrast to the dynamic beginning of Mark's gospel, where Jesus' death is introduced with suddenness and the effect of a shock halfway through in Mark 8. The fourth gospel has a more realised crucifixion, along with his realised eschatology. Both the death of Jesus and the eternal life that come from it are the realities from the very beginning of this narrative. Yeah. And as you say, it comes back to reading this gospel forwards and backwards and making mm. sense of the beginning in the light of where it ends. Yeah. James, great to spend time talking about this and digging mm. out some new treasures from the old scriptures. Uh, friends, mm. thank you very much for joining us. Don't forget to do those four things. So click like and subscribe, subscribe to the channel and share it on the social media. media. <laughs> and uh, do offer any comments and discussion, any reflections you've got. So thanks so much, James. Great to see you and look forward to seeing you next time.